Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. I just wanted to talk a little bit about demographics, and at least in the beginning of the show, if the blog talk statistics are correct, the uh, number of listeners to the archives has really gone up, which is very encouraging. And the demographics is, seems to be changing, seems to be um, more of a younger crowd, which is very, very interesting and, and encouraging as well. I probably won't get to the Meyer material until the end of the show. I want to play some clips of some events that are going on. The first two clips I might just let run together or just with a small break between. It's Robert David Steele, who is a CIA insider. He's interviewed a lot by Alex Jones and and some other people. I think I had him on the show once. Might try to get him again. I don't know if he would be willing to do that or not. Um, but he's talking about a Mars base. And I guess one of his contacts says there is a base on Mars. It has about 10,000 people in it. And they really don't have any way of getting back to Earth. Now, what's interesting is Courtney Brown, Dr. Courtney Brown, who I interviewed many times when he was still doing interviews. He's a remote viewer, and his remote viewers at the Farsight Institute saw the same kind of thing through remote viewing. So there might might be something to this. Um, the Meyer material has some interesting things to say about Mars. Perhaps we will talk about that just briefly But let's listen to Robert David Steele. It'll take me a second to get this all set up, so bear with me. Um, This may strike your listeners as way out, but we actually believe that there is a colony on Mars that is populated by children who were kidnapped and sent into space on a 20-year ride uh, so that once they get to Mars, they have no alternative but to be slaves on the Mars colony. Uh, there's all kinds of... Well, I, look, I know 90% of the, of, the, of the NASA missions are secret, and I've been told by high-level NASA engineers that, that you have no idea. There's so much stuff going on. But then it goes off into all that. I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing the media jumps on. But I know this. We see a bunch of a mechanical wreckage on Mars. And people say, oh, look, it looks like, you know, a mechanics. They go, oh, you're a conspiracy terrorist. Clearly, they don't want us looking into what's happening. Every time probes go over, they turn them off. Alex, you're one of the most original guys on the air. And, and I would, you asked what should you do. I think you should be the truth channel in America. Uh, and I think you should really try to systematically put guests on that Donald Trump is not listening to because they're being blocked from him. <laughs> Unelected global corporate government that has a eugenics-based anti-human operating system is not going to be popular if we're challenging it and speaking out against it. They tried to stonewall. That hasn't worked. Now they're trying destabilization. That hasn't worked. Mainstream media, corporations, institutions are being totally discredited. But how are they going to strike back? Well, that's Robert David Steele at the start of the next segment to get into that. I'm going to your calls, obviously, right now, and I want to get back into the Vatican. How big is this? The main confidant, the aide de camp. Uh, the, you know, the, the head Catholic of Australia arrested for a, reportedly a whole st- string of pedo ring garbage. It was this Pope came to power using pedo blackmail. That was even in The Guardian. So now what's happening? Uh, the word I get is, is that Trump has green-lighted going after the pedophiles. Obviously, they've got their operators in law, law enforcement as well. So there's a civil war over this. That's one reason the deep state's fighting so hard. Robert David Steele's going to talk about that more right now. With Robert David Silver taking phone calls. Stephen in Florida on the pedo gate situation. Go ahead. 
Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to say Romans 12 says, Give honor to whom honor is due. So I know you guys are patriots, Mr. Steele and Alex. I won't say thank you, but I do say I respect you, and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. And this, this issue about this pedophile ring and these pervert criminals, it infuriates me. It's one of my hot-button issues. Oh, it's and the only time I think about violence, and because I, I don't like being violent, but, I mean, I fantasize about, like, jabbing daggers in their eyes, stuff like that. I, I, I mean, I'm being honest. I can't help it. I, I, when I think about pedophiles torturing kids, I want to kill. Go ahead. Sorry. Same way. And I just wanted to say real quick before I get to that, Johnny Depp, look into his ties with Hunter Thompson, the Satanist that groomed him in Hollywood. When he says he wants to kill Trump, I don't think he's blowing smoke. I take that real serious. So look into that. But, you know, one of Hunter S. Thompson's best friends. I've... Okay. A few things covered there. First, the Mars base, the potential Mars base. I wanted to talk a little bit quickly about what, some of the things that the Meyer case says about Mars. It says um, a couple hundred thousand years ago there was a civilization on Mars they built pyramids and monuments. They were the descendants of a group of people uh, called the genetically manipulated people, which were brought to our solar system by a group from the Cirrus system. There, there were some, ex um, you know, in the Meyer material, there are what's called different space time configurations. And there are seven different space-time configurations in our material universe. So um, the constellations and the planets are kind of, in some sense, duplicated in these different space-time configurations. So there's a Sphere system in another space-time configuration where the people there, they were descended from the Larians, and they did a kind of genetic engineering on themselves in order to eliminate the tremendous tendency for warfare that they had. The Lyrians were very warlike, and they often practically destroyed themselves, um, and they destroyed entire planets. Uh, so these people from the Seer system, they decided to use a kind of genetic engineering on themselves in order to combat their own warlike nature. So they hopefully in future generations wouldn't destroy themselves. So they created a human being with a shortened lifespan of about 100 years. Um, and these people had a heightened aggression. Well, those people actually turned out to be the human beings in our solar systems because um, – the group from the Seer system, what they call the creator overlords, as they're called in the Meyer informations, um, decided to destroy the human beings that they were genetically engineering uh, to fight their wars because they decided they were just too dangerous and they might turn on them. And in fact, they might have turned on them. But there was a group of people, they were, they were part of the population in the Seer system, part of these creator overlords that were against the genocide of the genetically manipulated people. And they brought a group of the genetically manipulated people into our solar system. Some went to Mars, some went to another planet in our solar system called Melona. Uh, Melona was, I believe, somewhere in between, oh goodness, I've lost, it's either in between Mars and Earth or it was in between Mars and Jupiter. At this point, I'm having a hard time recalling. But the these are technically advanced humans from the Sierra system created a this genetically, this human race with a shortened lifespan with these people bore barbaric traits and they, they tended towards degeneration and cruelty and anyway, they, a group escaped from the Seer system, and they found refuge on Mars and Melona Phaeton, this other planet. 
And they constructed cities and pyramids and all kinds of stations um, on these two planets. So there was a civilization on Mars. There was a civilization on Malona. Malona was completely destroyed when the people on Malona diverted a ocean into a volcano which split their planet in half and caused a gigantic uh, disaster. So, you know, it's really amazing. At one point there were three planets in our solar system that had life. Uh, Mars eventually came into some very, very difficult times because of this thing called the destroyer comet, which periodically back then would come through our solar system. Anyway, there was a tremendous um, Mars was bombarded first of all by asteroids from the exploded planet Malona pieces of this planet. Uh, Secondly, um, even though part of the Martian population survived, when when the destroyer comet came through, it pretty much finished off the Martian civilization and made the planet uninhabitable. I believe some got off and came to the Earth and they managed to survive on Earth and that's how we got the people that are on our planet. All Earthlings now have the same heightened aggression, the same tendency towards warfare and a shortened lifespan. And this is, uh, there's a lot of information in the Meyer material kind of devoted to this, this whole story. I didn't really mean to get off on this humongous tangent. What's interesting is that Mars in the ancient past had a thousand fold more water in its largest rivers than on Earth. So, We have the large rivers on Earth, but um, on Mars they had rivers that were hundreds of kilometers in diameter and many thousands of kilometers in length. So Mars was a very, very different place in the ancient, ancient past. Yes, um, a lot of the things that were on Mars have been destroyed and um, not only in, in all of the tragedies that occurred, but there was another extraterrestrial group that came to Mars and destroyed some of these monuments and, and such. And I think this has happened relatively recently. So anyway, that was quite a long tangent. But um, I think I'll go back to um, playing our clips. I wanted to just get some of this information out that I think is very important because I think we could be headed for a war. And it's very disappointing to hear Trump being so aggressive like this. Let's go on and play, continue to play our clips. He's the famous artist. I interviewed him. He said Hunter Thompson was about to expose pedophile rings and things and that it was disinfo against him by uh, the pedophile rings because he was writing about it. Let me see what Robert David Steele has to say. Go ahead. No, I, I agree with that. And let me just point out let me just point out that pedophilia does not stop with sodomizing children. It goes straight into terrorizing them to adrenalize their blood and then murdering them. It also includes murdering them so that they can have their bone marrow harvested as well as body parts. Pedophilia is much This is the bigger. original g- growth hormone. Yes, yes. It's an anti-aging thing. And, and um, this may strike your listeners as way out, but we actually believe that there is a colony on Mars that is populated by children who were kidnapped and sent into space on a 20-year ride uh, so that once they get to Mars, they have no alternative but to be slaves on the Mars colony. Uh, there's all kinds of well, I, look. I know 90 percent of the, of the of the NASA missions are secret, and I've been told by high-level NASA engineers that, that you have no idea. There's so much stuff going on, but then it goes off into all that. 
I mean, you know, that's the kind of thing the media jumps on. But I know this. We see a bunch of a mechanical wreckage on Mars, and people say, oh, look, it looks like, you know, a mechanics. They go, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Clearly, they don't want us looking into what's happening. Every time probes go over, they turn them off. Alex, you're one of the most original guys on the air. And, and I would you asked what should you do. I think you should be the truth channel in America. Uh, and I think you should really try to systematically put guests on that Donald Trump is not listening to because they're being blocked from him. For example, Carl Denninger, co-founder of the Tea Party. He should be a guest on your show talking about how the Trump health plan, the Ryan health plan, is completely dishonest because it doesn't have a price list and it doesn't allow the government to negotiate with the companies. Uh, you should have Edgar Fagy, the uh, inventor of the automated payment transaction tax that would eliminate all taxes, including income taxes, on people like you and me, and it would tax currency and stock. Is that the Tobin tax? Is that the Tobin tax? Uh, I don't think so. It's, it, it's similar. It's a tiny fractional tax on every transaction, including internal corporate transactions where a lot of money laundering sure. goes on. Well, I don't know about Mars bases, but I know they've created massive thousands of different types of chimeras that are alien life forms on this Earth now. In ancient times, man roamed the earth in a constant state of hunt. He has disrespected our country greatly. He has said things that are horrific. And with me, he's not getting away with it. He got away with it for a long time between him and his family. He's not getting away with it. It's a whole new ball game. And he's not going to be saying those things. And he's certainly not going to be doing those things. Uh, I read about we're in Guam by August 15th. Let's see what he does with Guam. He does something in Guam. It will be an event the likes of which nobody's seen before, what will happen in North Korea. And when you say that, what, what do you mean? You'll see. You'll see. And he'll see. He dare. will see. It's not a dare. It's a statement. It has nothing to do with dare. That's a statement. He's not going to go around threatening Guam, and he's not going to threaten the United States, and he's not going to threaten Japan, and he's not going to threaten South Korea. No, that's not a, a dare, as you say. That is a statement of fact. Number one, I would like to denuke the world. I know that President Obama said global warming is the biggest threat. I totally disagree. I say that it's a simple one. Nuclear is our greatest threat worldwide. Not even a question. Not even close. So I'd like to denuke the world. I would like Russia and the United States and China and Pakistan and many other countries that have nuclear weapons, get rid of them. But until such time as they do, we will be the most powerful nuclear nation on Earth by far. Uh, the first order I gave to my generals, as you know, you know, Mike, uh, my first order was I want this, our nuclear arsenal, to be the biggest and the finest in the world. And we spent a lot of money. Well, that's quite disturbing. I did vote for Trump. I certainly am a supporter, but I cannot see any reason to <laughs> escalate and create more nuclear arms. We already have so many nuclear arms that we could destroy the whole globe many times over. I I'm very concerned that he's kind of taken this point of view, but it's interesting that perhaps this is why Billy stated that he wasn't really qualified to be president, which I may be understanding a little more clearly why Billy said these things. But let's let's move on to Lionel, uh, a guy that calls himself Lionel who I think made some very interesting comments about what's going, what Trump is saying and what he's doing here. So let's. President Trump, believe nothing you're being told about North Korea from your Pentagon. Believe nothing that you're being told about anyone from anybody that you have appointed or who's still hanging around in the White House, State Department, Pentagon, Justice Department, 
name it. You are on your own. And my message to America, did you learn nothing from Iraq? Did you learn nothing from Afghanistan? Did you learn nothing from Vietnam, from the Korean War, the first Korean War? I hope the last Korean War. The Korean War, which was basically a ceasefire. No victories in that one. We had that one all wrong, all wrong. Thank God for Matthew Ridgway. Does history mean anything to you, American public? Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, MSDNC, to you, Mr. and Mrs. Ham-Fisted Barstool Diplomat, we ought to get this nut. We've got people who are like magpies and minor birds repeating the same thing. Kim Jong-un is crazy. Kim Jong-un is insane. How do you know that? How do you know that? I don't know. Uh, they, they told me he's... I. I I guess. Look at him. What do you mean? No, I mean uh, his haircut. He's uh, he's uh, he's crazy, right? You sure? You sure about that? I thought Lionel did a very good job, kind of giving an overview of what's going on in the media right now with Kim Jong Un and this push towards war. It looks like we're pushing towards war and. Makes very little sense to me. Let's hear what General Wesley Clark has to say about the whole situation in North Korea. Joining me right now, former NATO ally, Supreme Commander General Wesley Clark. General Clark, good to have you here. Uh, obviously, some stuff going on, shall we say, right now. What's your recommendation here? Uh, can we actually go in and take out North Korea's nuclear arsenal? We probably could go in with massive force and we can destroy the whole country. But to do that, they, remember, you're dealing with a country that's had 60 or 70 years to put stuff underground in tunnels. Mm -hmm. So you're probably talking about, if you really want to get it, you want to be sure you get it, you're gonna, probably going to use nuclear weapons to get it. If you send in a few teams of special forces, you may get some of it, you won't get all of it. And to do that, you've got to disable their air defense network, shut down their security and so forth. So you alert them. The idea that you can really do a massive strike without somebody saying something totally surprised, catch China off guards, unlikely. Mm -hmm. Seems likely that China would alert North Korea so uh, because they don't want to see the United States take out North Korea and then move all the way to the border with China. So lots of different motives in the region. The best course of action for us right now, Trish, is talk directly to the leader in North Korea face-to-face, no, no, no bellicose public statements. Don't get the public alarm. Go see him personally and say, don't be doing this. Yeah. Your brain. Okay. A couple people, Lionel from Lionel Media and General Wesley Clark, I think both had some good advice on what to do in terms of North Korea. Now we're going to go on to what I think is pretty bizarre what uh, Trump's pastor is is saying about North Korea and well I'll just let you hear this and you can decide for yourself God has given him the authority to take out North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un Pastor Jeffress citing the Bible's book of Romans 13 which says in part for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. But not every religious leader agrees with that interpretation. Here for a discussion, that pastor, Robert Jeffers, and Fox News religious contributor, Father Jonathan Morris, joins us here in New York. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. to you, Pastor Jeffers, as well. All, all right. Uh, pastor Jeffers, uh, you certainly gave the Internet something to uh, talk about and <laughs> melt down over yesterday. Explain why you say that God has given... President Trump, the authority to attack North Korea. 
there is a great deal of confusion among Christians when it comes to this, this idea of using force to topple evil. And I wanted to clarify that I believe the Bible, especially Romans 13, does give President Trump moral authority to use whatever force necessary, including assassination or even war, to topple an evil dictator like Kim Jong-un. And uh, I believe the Bible is very clear about that. And while President Trump prefers a diplomatic solution to this problem, he's been talking about diplomacy for 19 years with North Korea. Mm -hmm. He's also willing to do whatever it takes to keep America safe. And one thing I know about President Trump after being around him for the last two years is this. Unlike his predecessor, when President Donald Trump draws a red line, he's not going to erase it, move away from it, or back down from it. Okay. And we ought to thank God every day we have a courageous leader like President Trump okay. in the White House. Okay, Pastor Jeffers, you cited Romans 13, but when you look at Romans 12, as you know, it is do not repay evil for evil. And so some would say that flies in the face of the argument you just made. Well, look, uh, Steve, uh, Paul wasn't schizophrenic. He knew what he was writing. In Romans 12, he was talking about our interpersonal relationships. Okay. We are to forgive. We are to turn the other cheek. Romans 13, the next chapter, deals with government, and the Bible never commands government to turn the other cheek or to forgive. All right. Father Jonathan, what do you think? Well, I think any time you take, first of all, I should say that I agree with so many things that uh, Pastor Jeffress says on other issues. For sure, we agree on many things. But as soon as you take one particular biblical passage and you use that as a justification for a very, uh, for a very particular and complex political policy, and especially a military policy, I think you're making a big mistake. Uh, when Solomon asked God for wisdom, it's because Political leaders and kings need wisdom, and things aren't so simple. And what President Trump needs is real wisdom and advice, and not a suggestion that he is justified in doing whatever he wants just because he has been given mm -hmm. civil authority. And it's very, very mm -hmm. dangerous, in my opinion, to tell him or to tell any religious, any political leader, because you have the authority, doesn't somehow means that you don't have the obligation mm -hmm. to be very wise and to be very prudent in your decisions. War is, event, is always a total failure of the human fa family. That's I think I'm going to fast forward a little bit, so to speak, jump forward a little bit to a, a, a really long clip, and I'm going to play a lot of this. I think this guy's got some interesting things to say. Hopefully this is the clip I think it is, and uh, if it is, it's a fellow named George Friedman. I don't know that I've heard him before, but I did hear him today, and very interesting things to say. I'll let you be the judge, as always, on Ohio Exopolitics, and uh, give a listen to this, and then on the second half, I will talk a little bit about the Meyer case. Hi. Is a global war coming? Of course. There's never been a century that didn't have a global war. In the 20th century, you know about uh, 19th century is the Napoleonic Wars. 18th century was the Seven Years' War. We can go back and back and back and back. But if you don't think there's a global war coming, then you're saying that the 21st century is going to be the first century in which there isn't a global war. And I will bet against you any amount you want. In fact, global war, all war is sitting with you right now. It's sitting in your pocket. I present to you the iPhone. You've seen this. It carries such superb tools on it as YouTube and Tinder and all the essentials. And you guys are so cool that you know that this represents the future and makes you completely different because, well, you're cool. Let's talk about it. 
foundation of this phone is a microchip. The microchip was developed to guide U.S. intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, against Soviet targets. It had to have a small computer in it. It had to be very light. It had to be very accurate. And the microchip was the solution. And all of the weapons that we used during the Cold War to threaten the annihilation of humanity was built on the microchip. And you now use it today because it's cool. But that's what it is. Take a look at the other thing. You have a camera in your phone, the digital camera. That was developed by the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office for spy satellites. The problem we had was that if you took regular pictures with film, how do you get them to Earth? So you had to have a way to take pictures of targets of various sorts that didn't require you to drop a, a Kodak film pack down to the Earth. because that's what they did at the beginning. And they had to develop some sort of way to take pictures that could get back to Earth fast, just the way you send selfies to your mother or something. And that was the digital camera. It was driven by something called the CCD, which I remember the name once, but I can't remember what it's about. And what it did was it took digital pictures that could be beamed back to Earth to target people. Your innocent little camera had its birth in spy satellites. There's GPS. You love it. You walk around the street looking at it instead of the traffic. You get killed. It's a cool device. GPS was invented by the United States Air Force. It was called NAVSTAR to guide cruise missiles to their targets and to our army units precision in their land navigation. In other words, it was invented to let soldiers know where they were. Okay? And it's the most dangerous thing you have in your device because if you don't get hit by a car, you're going to crash yours while you're staring at it. So it has a violent nature built in. Now, all of this is designed to get to the place where all humanity lives, which is the Internet. The Internet was developed by the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency to move classified data from one secret lab to the other. So something in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the lab's there, would move to Los Alamos, and that would be moved to Brookhaven National Laboratories. And what were they doing in these laboratories? Doing research on nuclear wars, because that was the big story then. It was developed with only one thing in mind, to make research more efficient. And when you get on the Internet, all the protocols you get and all the cool stuff that gets you around were developed by American scientists who were deeply involved in the Cold War. Now, you then have the cell phone, which most of you don't use anymore, because you irritate me by sending me text messages instead of picking up the phone. Okay. The cell phone was first deployed in 1985 by the United States Army and was used for the first time in Operation Desert War. And it was entirely invented to facilitate military communication. Bottom line is, there is nothing in this phone or if you're a religious fanatic in the Android. There was nothing in this that was not 
created for war. So you think about war as a distant thing. You think about war as something that doesn't really have to do with you. And then you pick up this phone, and every bit of it is drenched in war, in fear of war, and everything else. Now, the Americans are peculiar. In the United States government, they're not allowed to have patents. Basic rule is, if the U.S. government invented it, and it's not secret, it's yours for the taking. It's an odd rule, but it works for us. It means that everything we do in preparing for wars, designing aircraft, everything else, ultimately comes down to being available. So Steve Jobs, who is so cool, invented nothing. He took other people's inventions from the government put them together, and the only thing he invented was marketing. And that, that, was, that was pretty cool. Bill Gates invented nothing. MS-DOS was a program he bought from someone that had originally been developed for the Air Force. Zuckerberg invented even less. Your whole generation lives in a fantasy of creativity. The basic tools that guide your life. That fellow's name is George Friedman. Boy, he's got some really interesting idea, particularly about the cell phone and how it's related to war innovation. Well, I wanted to finish up the show and talk about some of the Meyer information that I've been reading lately, particularly in the My Thoughts. Something that Billy has to say about work, which I thought relates to each one of us, it says on page 330 of the book, My Thoughts, first the work, then the enjoyment. And so it actually is with all things of life, because everything is to be righteous. Then there must always first be something achieved and created before it can be used. This, therefore, also applies to positive thoughts and the entire positive thought pattern, from which all those values of life, which are actually and truthfully evolutive, in the sense of creational law, can first be developed in a righteous form. And all of that is always connected with evolutive enthusiasm, which does not tolerate any negativism. Okay, there are six things to keep in mind. Always tell yourself, or I always try to tell myself, uh, these six things, and it helps me stay neutral, positive, particularly if you're feeling a little um, stress coming in. You can say, I'm confident, I'm optimistic, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful, I'm enthusiastic, and I'm thankful. And this will help you to get rid of that negativism and bring back in a little neutral positive thinking because from such only negative res results come forth. But unfortunately, many human beings live exactly in this destructive negativism and are not able to free themselves. And there's also in a passage in the other part of the book that says, any man or woman who allows himself to think negative thoughts will soon be controlled by them. And that's so true. You will be controlled by your negative thoughts. They will run out of control. And it's very, very difficult to, to pull them back in once they get going. Okay. In this destructive negativism, um, they're not able to free themselves 
from it because everything is so ingrained in them that it has become their own and therefore a component of themselves. So we actually create negative neural pathways in our brain. And you, I'm sure you've experienced it. There are certain issues in your life, hot buttons, that if you don't watch it, your thoughts go that way and you start thinking about that one event that occurred and you'll rotate a negative thought over and over and over again, which is very, very unhealthy. Okay, in this regard, many have thus made themselves the real experts of negativism. And therefore, in their thoughts, they exercise a constant denial, which is then also actually realized by means of the might of the thoughts themselves. Okay, what we're searching for is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is one of these great problem solvers. Then the enthusiasm is able to work wonders when the ideas, imaginations, efforts, and wishes which are nurtured by your thoughts are transformed into action by means of the might of thoughts. Once enthusiasm, joy, and neutral positive equalized thinking are already exercised and effectively used even in the smallest and simplest things, then unexpected possibilities open themselves to the human being. So... If you have a particular bit of work to do, it often helps to think of that work and think about it in a very confident way. Like, you know, you are going to succeed. I am. um, I'm confident. I'm optimistic. Think these things and imagine yourself in that work scenario being successful. Another thing that's very important is patience. And therefore, in any case, patience must be brought into the course of the thoughts and must naturally also first be achieved, as must the optimism. So patience and optimism seem to go together, which is just as necessary with the entire thing. However, neither patience nor optimism can be built up and created by the human being in a single day. Truthfully, this often takes many months or even years and decades. So optimism and patience are things we're going to have to work on. Uh, Very, very important, very critical. Now, Billy Meyer is an 80-year-old man. He lives in Switzerland. And he has had extraterrestrial contact uh, for most of his life. And I, it looks like I actually have a caller here that's raised their hand. And Sorry, caller, I don't know how long you've had your hand up, but I'll go ahead and um, bring you on the air. Uh, 201, how are you today? I'm speaking with uh, a 201 number, 201-814. Hi, good afternoon. I really was just listening in. I'm actually on the bus. I was not hoping to speak. I'm sorry I did not know my hand were raised. Okay, no problem. I'll put you back on mute. Anyway, someone's listening, which is fine. You don't have to come on the air. But it kind of looked like they had raised their hand, but that's all right. Let me get back to where I was. Old oh, Billy Meyer. He's eight years old. He's from Switzerland. He lives in a tiny mountain village in Switzerland. He's written over 40, actually probably over 50 books. I think in one of his movies he mentioned something about him writing over 50 books. Now, um, uh, what I was reading from is called The Might of Thoughts. He has another great book called The Way to Live, another book called The Psyche, another one called The Goblet of Truth. And he's also written about 2,000 contact reports. Now, for some this may be very, very way out, but Billy alleges that he has had contacts with extraterrestrial humans, and one of those human beings that he had contact with was a woman named Askett, and she kind of started to be his mentor right around 1953. 
And she sent a ship to the area of Bulak, Switzerland, where Billy was growing up. And it landed on a hill where Billy would often sit and meditate and think about things. And this craft was a robotic craft, and a door opened on it, and Billy was kind of pulled into the craft. He said, as if by ghostly hands, he was pulled into this craft and sat down on a a chair, and suddenly there was a, a bright flash of light in the craft started to levitate up off this hill and it went over to Billy's village and it hovered over his home <laughs> where Billy lived. And at this point, the the craft has become invisible. Billy can't even see his own body. He just sees his rooftop and the surrounding area there in Switzerland. And suddenly, this craft is its off like a shot, and uh, he's seeing all of this uh, speed. In other words, the, the ground is whizzing by, and, and the craft is, is gaining altitude. And he looks down, and he sees what looks like the Indian Ocean. And he does recognize the Indian Ocean, and then he, and the craft goes higher and higher, and then he looks into a beautiful starry sky, and his stars are so beautiful. He's, he's never ever seen the stars from this perspective, and it was just um, overwhelming. And he saw the golden disk of the sun as well in, in the the pitch blackness of space. And the craft kept going and going, and then it eventually passed over the Middle East. And Billy recognized Jordan underneath him. And and the craft landed in the desert in a place called Jordan, um, which is a country in the Middle East. And Billy stepped out of the craft, and he was just hit by this heat because he had just been in Switzerland. And he felt the rocks, and the rocks were still hot, and the red sand was everywhere. And it was, at this point, it was starting to become a little dark. And again, Billy's about 16 years old. This is in 1953. He was already told by his previous mentor that on this day, he would meet his new mentor, who was a woman named Askett. And uh, he's looking around and nothing's happening. And then he looks up at the the night sky and he can see what looks like a falling star. And it's coming down lower and lower and lower. And then it gets larger and larger. And he realizes it's another ship. It's a 300-meter disc. And it's gigantic. And it's perfectly silent. And it continues to slowly come down. And it lands not too far from where he's standing. And it just sits there. It sits there for half an hour. Nothing happens. And he doesn't know what to think. He's been standing here for half an hour. And these two amazing things have just happened, but now nothing. And then he slowly sees a woman walk around the craft from the other side. And she's a very beautiful woman. And she's dressed kind of unusually. Um, he says that she looks somewhat like a modern angel. And he felt deep in his subconscious that he knew her. And he didn't really know why. He said hello and she introduced herself. Um, her name was Asket. He felt that he knew her. He asked her why he was having these feelings that he knew her. And she said she was not allowed to tell him that, but that if he searched his own memories, he might be able to get that information. Now, Asket was a woman from a parallel universe. The Meyer material says that she came from our sister universe. We 
evidently have a parallel sister universe, you can call it. It's called the Tao universe. The Meyer information refers to our universe as the D-E-R-N or the Dern universe. The two were evidently created at the same time. And they were created a lot longer ago than our scientists realized. Both universes were created 46 trillion years ago. The reason our scientists think the universe is about 45 billion years old is because that is the oldest that matter can be, is about 45 billion years. And then it slowly turns back into energy. Ask its people are called the Timmers. And originally, some 3,000 years ago, or probably, well, excuse me, probably much older and longer ago than that, they, um, they traveled from our universe into this parallel universe. They developed technology which allowed them to travel between the barriers between the universe without damaging this barrier or without damaging the ship itself. The Timmers are descended from a race of people called the Lyrians. And the Meyer information explains that the people from Lyra Vega are kind of the oldest race of human beings that they know of in our Milky Way galaxy. In fact, they did not originate in the Milky Way galaxy. They come from another galaxy. They came to our galaxy something like 22 million years ago. And these people, these Lyrians, were titans. They had tremendous uh, technology and a tremendous tremendous ability in their material consciousness. They had um, incredible abilities of telepathy, telekinesis, levitation. They could do many, many things. And the Timmers are descended from the people from Lyra Vega. Well, so are the people called the Playaren, which Billy's first mentor, a man named Sfoth, was a Playaren man. Now, the Timmers came to the Earth back in, uh, I think it was 1953, for the first time, and they stayed for about 11 years. Some group of them came in this gigantic ship that I was just telling you about. Now, they were here to stop a what I speculate was a nuclear disaster that was supposed to that could occur on the earth that may have affected other solar systems. Now they had to do that in a way without um negatively affecting our society's development. And that's very, very difficult thing to do. And that's one of the challenges that these higher advanced races have. And that's why we don't get that much contact because there are many, many negative consequences when a higher advanced race comes in contact with a much less advanced people. And that's why they will choose a specific contactee to contact with. And in the case of Billy, the reason these people from the Tao universe are are having these contacts with Billy is because of who Billy has been in his previous lifetime and the age of his spirit form. Billy has been the six other prophets. I say Billy, his spirit, his spirit form has been the people we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. Now, the way I pronounce some of those names, those names are not pronounced 
today the way they were in ancient times. But in these other lifetimes, Edward Albert Meyer was a teacher and he was a prophet. And these extraterrestrial people are here to help him get back up to the level of evolution that he was in those previous lifetimes. Now, it, stored in our subconscious is the programmed essences of the evolution that we had in previous lifetimes. So we get impulses from our subconscious that impulse our conscious mind and help us, guide us forward in the current lifetime. And those impulses come also from your spirit form. Now, the spirit form is a fragment of what's called the universal consciousness. And the universal consciousness is the spiritual energy slash intelligence which is behind all of the evolution that's occurring in our universe. Our universal consciousness is creates human beings for the purpose of evolving. And we're on the earth for two reasons, which are kind of two different sides of the same coin. We're here to evolve our consciousness. Now, Billy's third contact, which we didn't haven't talked about tonight, said this, a very profound thing. She said that... Uh, Love and wisdom go together, and that the creation and its laws are love and wisdom at the same time. So love and wisdom are the two purposes for our life. And then another area in the Meyer teachings that says that love will continue to be the purpose for your life. So love and wisdom go together, you see. Um, Love is the highest principle in all creation. And through it, everything exists in absolute logic. So everything that exists in nature, every flower, every bush, every tree, every bird, every cat, every dog, every human being has a purpose. Uh, Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. And your purpose as a human being is the evolution of your consciousness or the gaining of, of wisdom. Now, in order to be able to gain wisdom, one of the challenges that we have is learning to control our thoughts, because if our thoughts get out of control, we won't be going down the path of gaining wisdom, but we'll go down the path of self-destruction. So I want to get back again to talking about the kinds of thoughts that we need to have in order to stay on the path of wisdom and love. And I'm running out of time, but one of these important thoughts is enthusiasm. So try to foster enthusiasm because enthusiasm can be a very great benefit to the human being. However, its absence will mean an absence of initiative. So focus on being enthusiastic in your life. And I want to thank everyone for listening You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Have a great day.